Professor uh, Craig Palmer, to teach us in the begin and open our, and open our conference. What can modern evolutionary theory contribute to the understanding of traditional religions? I had the pleasure of meeting Craig a few months ago. Uh, he's an evolutionary anthropologist in Missouri. He's a, reacher, he's a researcher and a true altruist, I would say. Indeed, later on this afternoon, he'll teach us in his second presentation about righteous Gentiles, but I think that it can apply to himself as well. Why he does what he does, because he had a, could have had a life fishing in a, in a fishing village, and in cho instead he chose to the life of an acad academician. Craig. I'd like to add my thanks to uh, Dr. Galinkin, Dr. and Rabbi uh, Sheryl Fox and Rick Goldberg, and everyone else here at the Schechter Institute who made it possible for me to come here and talk to you today. Uh, I'm still trying to uh, react to that introduction. I think giving up a life as a lobster fisherman in Maine to be an academic is just a sign of foolishness and <laughs> has nothing to do with altruism whatsoever, but I'm still thinking about it. Uh, <clears throat> what I'm going to do here today is start with a brief general overview of some of the major concepts of evolutionary biology such as proximate and ultimate causation and the naturalistic fallacy. Then I'm going to briefly describe four of the major, as in most popular, uh, evolutionary explanations of religion. And we'll find that this will require a brief introduction to the evolutionary explanations of altruism, because at least three of the four most popular explanations of religion are based on evolutionary explanations of altruism. And then hopefully, just to make it a little bit more interesting, I'll try to convince you that despite all of the success evolutionary theory has had in explaining human behavior, the evolutionary explanation of religion is still very inadequate in the sense that it cannot explain one of the most fundamental aspects of traditional religions. And then I will conclude by briefly describing what I think might be an evolutionary explanation that can better explain uh, religion. So first of all, proximate causation is simply all of the factors that influence the development of any living thing, starting at conception and continuing throughout the life of the individual. Proximate causation can always be written in this simple formula, meaning that the proximate cause of any aspect of any living thing is its genotype, the genes which it has in its body, plus all of the factors in the environment that interact with those genes in order to produce the phenotype. Phenotype is just a fancy word for any trait, anything you can name about any living thing. The important part of this for our purposes is that behavior is part of a phenotype. So the proximate causation of any behavior is always genes interacting with lots of things in the environment throughout the lifetime of the individual leading up to the behavior. This is even true of human cultural behavior, such as religion. Still, even with something that's a cultural behavior, you always have to have genes, represented here by the DNA strands, plus the environment, which is air, water, other living things, food, everything in the environment. But to get what we call a cultural behavior, such as religion, you must also have other people in that environment behaving in a certain way in order to get that particular cultural behavior. The point is that although people often talk about some behaviors genetic and some's environmental, and then think that it's only the genetic behavior that's subject to natural selection, that's not true. All behaviors, the result of both genes and the environment, and therefore all behavior has an additional, in addition to proximate causation, all behavior has ultimate or evolutionary causation. And ultimate or evolutionary causation is based on three concepts, natural selection, adaptation, and function. Natural selection is simply the effect of inheritable elements, such as genes, on their own frequency in succeeding generations. 
if an inheritable element has effects that increase its own frequency in succeeding generations, we say selection favors that trait, or there's been selection for that trait. If the inheritable element has effects that decrease its frequency, we say it's being selected against. An adaptation in evolutionary biology is simply a trait that exists because it itself was favored by natural selection. This distinguishes adaptations from other traits that are only byproducts. A byproduct is a trait that exists even though it itself was not favored by natural selection. It exists as merely a side effect or byproduct of selection for some other trait. Therefore, both byproducts and adaptations have effects, but only adaptations have a function because the function of a trait is that effect that caused the trait to be favored by natural selection. So what evolutionary biologists do, whether they're trying to explain the human eye or religion, is try to determine is, is the trait an adaptation or a byproduct? And they do that by trying to identify if that trait has a function or not. Now before we can start to answer the question, is religion an adaptation or a byproduct? We need to avoid the naturalistic fallacy. The naturalistic fallacy is the mistake of thinking that a statement about how the world is, such as is religion an adaptation or is it a byproduct, is the mistake of thinking that implies a statement about what should be or what's good or bad. So we need to avoid, for example, if we become convinced that religion is an adaptation, we have to avoid the mistake of thinking that that means people should be religious or that religion is good. We also need to avoid the mistake of if we decide that religion is not an adaptation, that does not necessarily imply that religion is bad or that people should not be religious. These are completely separate questions. So now we're able to ask the question, is religion an adaptation or a byproduct? And to start, I'd like to ask you, if you think about it, how many people would answer this question, do religious beliefs cause religious behavior? Could you raise your hand if you would answer that question, yes, religious behavior is caused by religious beliefs? How many would answer the question, no? Would, okay, pretty even. Would, okay, so far no one has given the answer I would give. Does anyone else have another answer to this question? Okay, so you would say the truth is, was reversed. Okay, that's still not my answer, so. You're wrong. Uh, no. <laughs> yes? By society, by environment, by balance. Causes religious behavior, not religious beliefs. Okay. Maybe getting closer. Anyone else have an answer? My answer is, I don't know. <laughs> no, very seriously, I can't tell. Because for me to know whether religious beliefs cause religious behavior, I'd have to be able to tell who has religious beliefs. Who are the true believers? I can't do it. But evidently, other evolutionary biologists can because they all talk about religious beliefs as the cause of religious behavior. So I, since I'm summarizing the field, I'm going to talk that way and put it in the phrase of, are religious beliefs an adaptation or a byproduct? But just want you to know, I don't know. If someone can identify the true believers after my talk, could you let me know how? So, yes. Well, a I don't know. You're asking me. I can't tell. I mean, I can't tell who's a true believer, a believer, a non-believer. I can't tell. But let me know how. I'll, I'd be happy to be able to tell either a true believer or a believer. Okay. Since normal evolutionary biologists can somehow tell, they phrase the question, are religious beliefs an adaptation or a byproduct? We'll start with, let's say, very widely accepted explanation of religious belief as only a byproduct. This explanation holds that religion started as belief in spirits. And religious belief in spirits is a byproduct 
of a hypersensitive agency detection adaptation. Okay? Put in normal English, that means that humans evolved to perceive entities that could act, that could perform actions, even when those entities didn't exist. And the reason we had this hypersensitive agency detection adaptation was to decrease the chances of getting killed by a predator. Picture back several tens of thousands of years ago. Humans are constantly walking through the forest and seeing slight movements out of the corner of their eye. And they have a decision to make. Is that just the wind causing the branch to move? In which case, I'll just continue to walk. Or is that a predator causing the movement that might kill me? Making the wrong decision either way has costs. But natural selection would have favored those people who minimize the chance of making the mistake of thinking it's just the wind when it's a predator, because those people die. So it was selected for as people who run away from the wind causing branches because they perceive it might be a predator. And they use up all that energy, but they live to reproduce. Because they, those are the, that's what was selected for is to avoid mistaking a predator for only the wind. Given that people are constantly running away from entities that are kind of like an organism that can act, but you really can't see it, this, the argument says, leads to belief in spirits that these things that can kind of act like an organism but you can't see them are spirits. In one form of this argument, all of the rest of religion, all of the religious rituals, practices, all the specific religious beliefs are all just a byproduct of this selection for hypersensitive predator detection. Therefore, from this hypothesis, religious, religion in general is all just a byproduct and has no evolutionary function. Religion, was, it's, religion itself was never favored by natural selection. The majority of evolutionary biologists, however, argue that religious belief is an adaptation because they see that however religious belief started, it then had effects that were subject to natural selection. And the majority of evolutionary biologists argue that those effects were favored by natural selection. Okay? By far and away, the most popular argument is that the reason religion was favored by natural selection is that it produced a kind of apparently altruistic behavior. So in order to evaluate these three religious belief as adaptation explanations, I'm going to have to give you a very brief summary of evolutionary explanations of altruism. In evolutionary biology, altruism refers to an individual sacrificing their own reproductive success to increase someone else's. Altruism is a puzzle to evolutionary theory because in general, natural selection should favor the opposite, should favor the individual that some, can somehow get things from other people to increase their own reproductive success and lower those of competitors. But evolutionary theorists have come up with four possible explanations of how altruism could be an adaptation. Three of these four explanations are currently very popular. These three explanations of altruism are group selection, kin selection, and reciprocal altruism. Group selection simply states that even though selection may operate against altruism at the level of the individual, the individual altruist, altruist reduces his or her reproductive success, that same altruism helps the group survive. And therefore, altruism was favored by group selection. Very controversial. Many evolutionary theorists do not think group selection actually works. For one thing, they can't see how selection at the group for altruism could possibly happen fast enough to offset selection against altruism at the level of the individual. But some evolutionary theorists that may think that maybe group selection can explain some forms of altruism. Much more agreement about the second explanation, kin selection. General agreement that natural selection will favor altruism 
if you're altruistic towards a very closely related relative, such as a full sibling. Why? Because a full sibling has a 50% chance of having the same genes you do. So by benefiting to the reproductive success of a sibling, you may be increasing your fitness, your contribution of genes to the next generation. Because the offspring of your sibling has a chance to have your genes. So kin selection appears to explain altruism that's very beneficial and directed towards a very close relative. But it doesn't seem to account for much of religion, because religion usually involves people who are either very distantly related or not seem to be related at all. So the basis for those three, I would say, major evolutionary explanations of religion is reciprocal altruism. The problem is reciprocal altruism is misnamed. Reciprocal altruism is not altruism. It's a wise investment. Reciprocal altruism is when I give you something, and it looks like altruism, but if you watch long enough, it's not, because it gets reciprocated with a newer model. Okay? It gets rewarded even more. So I actually come out ahead. Okay? If that reward comes directly from the person who received it, it's known as direct reciprocal altruism. If someone else sees me being an altruist and rewards me, it's indirect reciprocal altruism, okay? So what looks to be altruism is actually just a way of increasing one's own reproductive success. Reciprocal altruism can increase, increase reproductive success, but it has to overcome some obstacles, okay? First of all, it's kind of risky. If I were to give you this, well, actually, this is not risky because this isn't mine. So if I were, <laughs> but if this was mine, if I gave that to you, it'd be risky because I don't know if you'd give it back. And if you don't give it back, I end up actually being an altruist and I'm selected against. But if for some reason I can give it to you, I can get more back and then get more from other acts. Look at it the other way. Reciprocal altruism to work has to overcome temptation. If you're the one who receives the first gift, you're tempted to keep it. But if you do that, that person won't give you anything else in the future, nor will anyone else. So for reciprocal altruism to evolve, you have to overcome the risk of being the first one to give and the temptation of being the first one who has to pay back. Now another question is, why would a third party ever reward an altruist? You know, I give something to you, why would you give me something? Now, the explanation for this is something called costly signaling theory, which says that being an altruist is a costly signal, communication. And because it's costly, it's hard to fake. I can't give you something unless I have enough to give, okay? And therefore, if I'm giving things, I must be pretty high quality. I must have had pretty good genes that allow me to accumulate things so I can give. Other people see that and go, ah, that would be a good person to start reciprocating with. They probably have a lot to give and they're most likely to give it. They're an altruist. So we're selected to see altruists as people who might be good trading partners, got, might be good military allies, or might be good mates. And these explanations of reciprocal altruism explain the major evolutionary explanations of religion. Example number one, the specific religious belief in an afterlife where good, to de where good deeds, including altruism, gets rewarded is an adaptation whose function is to make people willing to take that risk of being the first person to give. Because if I believe I will get rewarded in an afterlife, I'll go ahead and give this to you. Because even if you don't give it back, I'm still getting rewarded later on. Now this was selected for that because I now benefit over the long term because we have lots of reciprocity. And even if I don't have an afterlife, 
I end up ahead of the game. Okay? Uh, second explanation is the belief in an all-powerful, all-knowing God okay, who punishes the failure to reciprocate. It's an adaptation whose function is to get, help people, help believers to resist that temptation to not reciprocate. Okay? I give you something valuable, you're very tempted to just keep it and not return anything. But you're a believer that if you don't reciprocate, God will punish you, so you reciprocate. And because of that, believers benefit through the long-term consequences of reciprocal altruism. Okay. One more. The belief that a supernatural being, your God, requires you to make a sacrifice is an adaptation which functions as an honest signal that you are committed to long-term reciprocal altruism, that you will not be a cheater. You will pay back. Why? The logic goes that if you start your interaction with other people in your religion with, by making a sacrifice, that sacrifice is not going to be offset by the small rewards of cheating the first time someone gives you something. The only way that you can make up for that initial sacrifice is if you stay in long-term, repeated, reciprocally altruistic behaviors that you gradually benefit from. So anyone who makes a sacrifice is a good bet. They won't cheat on you. They'll stick it out for the long term. So in very broad strokes, now answer the question, what can, or at least up to what point, up to this point, what has modern evolutionary theory contributed to the understanding of traditional religions? Well, it depends who you ask, but some evolutionary theorists would say, Religion, religious beliefs, are merely a byproduct of a hyperactive predator detention mechanism, detection mechanism, in which case religion itself has no evolutionary function. Doesn't mean it's bad, doesn't mean people shouldn't be religious, but evolutionarily it has no function. Or the more likely answer you would get is religious beliefs are an adaptation, and the function of religion what has caused it to be favored by natural selection is that it creates reciprocal altruism which increases the individual's reproductive success. Now, I have been actually as honest and accurate as I can be so far in summing up the explanations of religion. The question is, how impressed are you? How, how much has the contribution of evolutionary theory been to your understanding of religion? And given that the main answer has been, it's all about reciprocal altruism, I'd ask you to ask yourself this question. Can all of the altruistic acts encouraged by religious traditions really be explained, or more accurately explained away, as just another way to manipulate other individuals to increase your own reproductive success through reciprocal altruism. I'm just curious, how many people would answer that question, yes? The only place I really need to look is at the evolutionary psychologist, but no, we don't care, okay? I would also answer the, yeah. yes, no? Just, I understand, don't raise your hands, I'm desperate for feedback, so it's just, <laughs> I'll, I'll jump on it, yes? I agree. Specifically, the reason I answer this question, no, is I'm a cultural anthropologist, and what I study is not world religions, not Islam or Judaism or Christianity or Hindu or Buddhism. I study what most people would call primitive religions or traditional tribal religions, what I call traditional kinship-only religions, the religions that existed for tens of thousands of years before there were any world religions. And from my study of that, the reason I answer this question, no, is that there's an unexplained, fundamental aspect of religion that this reciprocal altruism stuff does not get at. Among these tribal religions, 
there's a name given for what is, I would say, always, universally, in all known human cultures, the central moral code of traditional religions. Anthropologists call it the axiom of kinship amity. What it is, is that universally traditional religions prescribe altruism towards any kin, not just your siblings, but distant, distant cousins. In many societies, there may be tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of essentially cousins that you can identify as kin, and toward all of them, you should exhibit not reciprocity, but generosity, actual altruism. This just doesn't seem to fit reciprocity. Now, some other evolutionary psychologists have also been skeptical that world religions fit reciprocal altruism. For example, John Tian, an evolutionary psychologist, points out this aspect of Christianity. Give to everyone who begs from you, and of him who takes away your goods, do not ask them again. And Tian points out that this appears to be the direct opposite of reciprocal altruism. Jesus here seems to be demanding a complete reorientation of our moral outlook, where we should reject the logic of reciprocation completely. He advocates giving without restriction and with no expectation of re reciprocation. And according to the conventional theories of evolutionary biology, such altruism could not have evolved. Tian goes on to explain exactly what would happen okay, to someone, an individual who did behave in this way. I won't read all of this. They would have been crushed in the struggle for reproductive fitness. If by chance an altruist would actually follow the teachings in that biblical practice, they would be marked a sucker and taken advantage by less naive individuals. Now, hopefully, some of you are asking the question, what about Judaism? Okay, as you probably know already, I know essentially nothing about Judaism, so I put this as a question. For example, one thing you might ask, does the Jewish tradition of charity or righteous behavior or just behavior, can it be explained as existing just because it's another way to encourage people to benefit through reciprocal altruism? And does this include, again, if I have this right, even the second highest level of giving out of the eight which because it stipulates, as I understand, that the identity of the giver and the receiver is kept secret, to me, superficially, that seems to be, be altruistic even when there's no chance that you will get reciprocated that's for it. The, that's the best way to do it. I thought it was the second best. No, the best way is to help them. Okay. But it's pretty good. Okay. No reciprocation. Okay, so there's the puzzle. The ideal way of being altruistic is the way that evolutionary theory can't explain. I'm done. No. <laughs> Close. Okay. What about this one? The evolutionary biologist John Hardin once said about love your neighbor as yourself, if Moses had been transmitting the word of his God to modern biologists, he might have said, Love your neighbor as if our degree of relatedness equals one. That is, as if all of your genes are identical. This is the opposite of reciprocity. Because if you treat someone else as if they are you, the whole concept of having to give something back becomes irrelevant. If, if I give something to you, that's exactly the same as if I keep it. So I shouldn't care whether it's given back or not. To understand just how unfit, in an evolutionary sense, behaving this way would be, remember, full siblings are only related by 50%. So selection would quickly work against, it would seem, a sibling who even treated a sibling 60% as valuable to them as they are to themselves. Any individual who treated a complete unrelated neighbor as valuable as themselves, what would happen to them? Well, because self-sacrificial altruism such as that is the opposite of reproductive fitness, it is obvious that natural selection would eliminate it. Yet, 
as I understand, love your neighbor as yourself is a fairly important part of traditional religions. So I will quickly toss out what I've been able to come up with as an alternative evolutionary explanation that maybe can better account for this fundamental altruism encouraged by traditional religions. I start this quick explanation by almost pure coincidence <laughs> by kind of quoting the next speaker, Andy Thompson, who asked, I do this because he asked a very insightful question in a uh, book chapter back in 2001. Essentially, why is it that a given individual's religion just happens to be the same as the religion of their parents, and that just happens to be the same as the religion of their parents? Now, I know that sometimes people can change religions, but through most of human existence, this was really true. The answer is not complicated. Whatever you're thinking is probably right. But the consequences of that answer for evolution have not been appreciated. The answer is parents obviously have something to do with this. Parents obviously influence their children in certain ways so that the children ends up having the same religion. Fair enough? There's a name for such parental influence in evolutionary biology. It's called parental manipulation. Parental manipulation happens to also be the fourth evolutionary explanation of altruism. Okay. What parental manipulation, how it produces altruism, what it's based on can be shown in this simple chart. The top triangle is the parent, the bottom two triangles are that parent's offspring. So these two offspring at the bottom are siblings, and as we've said, they're related by 0.5. They should only value each other half as much as they value themselves. But from the parent's perspective, the parent is equally related to both offspring. Therefore, parents will be selected, be favored by natural selection, if they manipulate offspring to act as if they were related to their siblings 1.0. Okay? The interesting thing about parental manipulation is that it can produce altruism, cause an individual to engage in altruism that is actually disadvantageous to their own reproductive success. That's actually against their evolutionary interests. Okay. Now, parental manipulation is still used in evolutionary biology to explain lots of behavior and lots of species. But it isn't used that much in regards to humans. Although, do parents influence, we won't say manipulate, influence the behavior of their offspring? Maybe a little? Okay. In fact, humans have up to a certain point, but that point's much longer than in most other species. And one of the ways we can do this real effectively is we can use language. What would you tell? What would you tell to your offspring to maybe get them to treat each other as, do you think that would work? Treat your sibling as if you're related by 1.0. <laughs> but maybe you could say something like, Love your sibling as you love yourself. That's still not going to do it. No, because the, ch the child's going to resist that. So you have to say something else to make it more effective. And I'll be watching even after I die. <laughs> I'm glad you laughed because that's not a joke. The other thing that I've learned in my study of religions in non-world religions in traditions, the other thing all known traditional religions have in common is that one of the supernatural claims they make is that dead ancestors can still influence and or be influenced by the behavior of their living descendants. Okay? And I say, whether you believe it or not, that statement will get your attention and therefore maybe influence them a bit more. Try it. Tell me what you like. You can get I was going to bring them in after they're, they're outside there to, to show that this doesn't always work. I need to say no more. <laughs> did, they, did he get you up to about 0.6? Oh, we'll talk later. Okay, it's too, a little too personal. I got it. Okay. But the question is, why hasn't this been appreciated? And I think the reason is, this just increases the altruism among siblings, and you're pretty altruistic anyway. What's the big deal? It has nothing to do with religion, because religion involves people who aren't closely related. But what people have failed to appreciate 
is the evolutionary consequences of parental manipulation becoming traditional. That is, if you repeat what your father told you and tell your offspring to love each other, that will also be in your parents' evolutionary interest and will have profound consequences. How do you possibly do this? Well, first, the reason that this would be selected for is that original parent is not just equally related to both offspring. They'll be equally related to all grandchildren. So it will be in the parent's interest to influence all grandchildren to love each other as if they love themselves. Equally related to all great, great, great grandchildren. And therefore it would be in that original parent's interest to somehow influence all of those descendants to love each other. But wait, the parent will die long before those people exist. A parent couldn't possibly influence the behavior of their great, great, great grandkids, could they? In fact, it wouldn't be very difficult. All they have to do is add on, after telling you to love your co-descendant, your sibling, also tell your children that. And then they might add and tell them, I'll still be watching. Do we have any evidence that these three things take place? Yes. Love your co-descendant as you love yourself. I would say is this another way of phrasing the axiom of kinship amity? Okay. Love your co-descendant as yourself is a universal moral code. Okay. And as I already mentioned, saying that your dead ancestors will still be watching is universal. Do we have any examples in traditional religions of telling children to repeat but they're here to influence their own children. I'd say that's universal too. And the evolutionary psychologist Richard Sosis points out, and I'll take his word for it, arguably the central Jewish prayer emphasizes the importance of teaching the Torah's laws to children. And this is the first prayer that children learn. So you see, and I say this is universal, this is not unique to Judaism, all three of these aspects. The last question is, would natural selection really favor someone who starts a tradition encouraging this type of unfit altruism among some of their descendants? Say so the answer depends on the answer to this question. If you take any course in evolutionary theory, you might get this as in on your first exam. What does natural selection maximize? Number of children, number of grandchildren, great-grandchildren, or some later generation? Probably to pass that exam, all you need to do is know that the first answer is not correct. Natural selection does not maximize number of children. Why? Because you can often have fewer children, but by making those children higher quality, end up having more grandchildren. Having lots of children, none of whom survive to reproduce, is not going to be favored by natural selection. All evolutionary biologists know that, although they often ignore it and just count number of children. What's almost always ignored is that the same thing's true about grandchildren. You can reduce the number of grandchildren you have and in so doing increase the number of descendants you have in a later generation. The ideal, the true answer to this question is ideally the best way to measure evolutionary success is the number of descendants alive after some very large number of generations. Okay. So that's why to draw attention to this, I like to talk about descendant leaving success is what natural selection favors instead of reproductive success. Therefore, my explanation of <clears throat> religion comes from a combination of traditional parental manipulation and this concept of descendant leaving success. And this comes to a new explanation of religion as an adaptation. I'll call this the tradition hypothesis. And I'll say that when parental manipulation becomes traditional, it can cause altruism that decreases reproductive success, that's number of children, but increases long-term descendant leaving success. And I say this is the effect of traditional religions, it should be, that cause them to be favored by natural selection. Okay? And maybe a good way to remember this is that I suggest this is the evolutionary function of traditional religions. Very quickly, just to show you that this really can work, picture this parent 
three kids, five grandkids, seven great grandkids. Let's just say that's what would happen without any traditions influencing the behavior of descendants. And then let's introduce a tradition that reduces reproductive su success and see if it can increase longer term descendant leaving success. Okay, the parent manipulates this male offspring to give up their life, to sacrifice for their siblings. Which one of you would that be? <laughs> that is not in your evolutionary interest. It doesn't mean it's bad, but it's not. But it's in your parents' evolutionary interest because that altruism that reduces your reproductive success from three to two, you sacrifice for your siblings, and that pays off in more grandkids. Even though one of those grandkids is influenced by the, and think about this, it's gonna be one of your kids, so this, yeah, sad, but okay. They're gonna be influenced by this tradition. They're gonna give up their life and reproductive success, but do so in a way that benefits their co-descendants, and that, even though it causes one more to go, ends up with, in this case, eight great-grandchildren instead of seven. Okay? So, suggest that, again, love your co-descendant as yourself or kinship amity is the universal moral code in all traditional religions. And the reason it's found in all traditions is that it, humans who did not pass on that tradition didn't leave his descendants long enough for anthropologists to ever know of them, okay? Eventually, this was so successful after many more generations that people started to bump into other people, okay, who they didn't recognize as kin. And at this point, love your co-descendant as yourself gets replaced by love your neighbor, whether they're a co-descendant or not, as you love yourself. Typically, the way this would be done is just changing the moral code by saying, hey, you know what? Your earliest ancestor is actually a sibling of my earliest ancestor. So we're really all like co-descendants. When did this first happen? Many scholars would tell you 2,000 years ago. Who was the first person to make this change? Jesus. What did he do? Jesus referred to God as father, not Abraham. I happen to think that Christianity is a very clear example of this expansion of love your co-descendant to love your neighbor. But it's not the only time this has happened, and it's not even close to the earliest time. Closer to the truth is Jared Diamond's statement that around 7,500 years ago, some parts of the world a couple thousand years before that, when people had sustained contact with other people who they did not consider kin and had to exist without attempting to kill them, that's when this expansion of love your co-descendant to love your neighbor first took place. Much of human history since then, I would suggest, is the story of some attempts at this that have been successful, some so successful that the people down a number of generations don't even know that they're not really co-descendants. But of course, many other examples when this hasn't been successful, and the two sides try to kill each other or even split apart in new ways. So, to conclude, Darwin was wrong. When he said, love your neighbor as yourself lies at the foundation of morality. Darwin was puzzled by this fact and couldn't explain it other than by group selection, but he immediately pointed out the problem with group selection, that it couldn't offset selection for selfishness. But the reason Darwin was wrong is that he was looking at only the perspective from 19th century Europe. From that perspective, it looked like love your neighbor was the earliest fundamental moral code. If Darwin had known about all the anthropological data of traditional kin-only societies from around the world, he would have suggested that love your, he would realize that love your neighbor as yourself is not the foundation of morality. It's a fairly recent addition to what's the real evolutionary foundation of morality, which I would suggest is love your co-descendant as yourself. And I suggest that was the function of traditional religions. Thank you.
by the result of uh, Iran just changing to have to the most successful traditional religion in, in all the world because they are closely rela related Han Chinese and there are a lot of them now. All I know is, is really about Confucianism. And, and that seems to fit this love your co-descendant and respect ancestors and traditions and the claim that ancestors will still be influenced by the behavior of the descendants. I think that fits pretty well. Beyond that, I have to admit, I only know a couple of ethnographies on earlier Chinese. I'm sure you know more than I do. Do you think the Chinese examples fit this or go against it? You have to. By the results of Chinese people, you have to look far further, far further, and find the, why it is. Maybe it's right, maybe it's wrong, maybe it's against yeah. your theory, maybe it's. Yeah, okay. well, from what I know, I would say Confucianism is one of the strongest supporting examples. But it's much uh, later. Okay, I mean, it's, it's probably one of these expansion of love your neighbor to. Mm -hmm. okay. All I know is that all the ethnographic reports, descriptions by anthropologists of traditional cultures, you find the axiom of kinship amity, okay? I've done a study looking for any, even the ones that are claimed not to have that, if you look at the descriptions, you actually find it. Just like you actually find this talk about dead ancestors, if you look for it. If you run across some specific ones that don't say love your co-descendants, please let me know, because I'd be very interested. Yes? Okay, first question, what about all the strife, okay? Remember, parents are trying to get offspring to behave differently than they've evolved to behave in a way, in the way they might want to. So that's why you have to really try hard to be effective at it. I would say natural selection has weeded out many people who attempted and were not as successful at influencing the behavior there. I would suggest that story, traditional stories of any kind that point to strife between kin, do so to show people the negative consequences of not cooperating. And, and to, so people can learn. Yeah, I think stories basically in, describe behavior that leads to good consequences so that the descendants will copy that behavior or shows behavior that doesn't work out and shows the negative consequences in hopes that it will influence the people not to do it. So if the message of biblical stories was that it is good to have strife with kin, and you should kill kin, then I'd be wrong. But if it just says that, you know, this is hard, you're gonna be tempted to, and bad things will happen, then that would, would fit. Now to your larger question about, if I understand, is the same proximate causation, is it always genes and environment determining everything? Not just our bodies, not just our brains, not just behavior, but our souls, our mind? My answer is, Everything that can be identified about an organism, which is, if you remember, that's the definition of phenotype, 
everything that can be identified empirically seems to be the result of genes interacting with the environment. That doesn't mean that there aren't other things that are murky because we can't identify them, and who knows what causes those. Again, I can't even tell if beliefs exist, so you're probably not too helpful there. Did that kind of answer your questions? Um, a bit. <laughs> I, I can't disagree. Religion encourages altruism among those people who communicate acceptance of the same religious claims. Okay? Often, that sets people in opposition to those people who don't communicate acceptance of those claims but communicate acceptance of others. Okay? So there's nothing automatic about this. As I said, the story of human history is both the story of some successes of people coming to treat other people as neighbors, even though they're not actually kin, treat them as if, and lots of examples of failures. I can't think of a single religion that uh, succeeded in getting people to love others who did not share their Okay, so far maybe no religion has been able to get all people to love each other, but I said there's lots of evidence that within certain religions, there's a lot of altruism and cooperation more than would be expected by evolutionary theory. But you're absolutely right, it's not everyone. Question is, could it be everyone? And could this knowledge help create that? Yes. The question was, if I can kind of paraphrase, how could morality and altruism be created among non-believers, among non-religious people? Again, the key is being influenced by others to do that way. For most humans, it's been influenced by parents. I think the reason morality has always been associated with religion is because adding those supernatural claims, like I'll be watching, make the influence more effective. It gets the person's attention. But it doesn't mean that you can't influence people to cooperate without religious talk. It may be more difficult. There may be other ways that are actually more effective at doing it. Okay? Uh, Richard Sosis, some of you may know, has done an interesting study looking at how long different kibbutz exist, religious versus not religious, and seems to suggest you know, that those that use the religious talk increase a little bit more altruism and stick together longer. Okay? I mean, so, so it doesn't mean it's not possible. It's just that religion maybe makes the encouragement of altruism more effective. Sometimes ideology, uh, uh, we can use ideology instead of religion. Like theology? I don't, I don't ideology. Ideology, like community ideology or, or other? We, we can do lots of things. We can do sports teams, okay? But there seems to, I would suggest there's something inherent in religion that makes it more effective. What I've suggested is, is when we make a supernatural claim, like I'll be watching even after I die, and someone else communicates acceptance, you know that their acceptance cannot be based on the evidence of their senses. So it's got to be, it communicates they're willing to accept your influence. And I think that's what makes religious behavior particularly effective.
And am I right that your people is a bit ambiguous as to whether it means only your actual kin? That's what it says. Oh, it means the sons of your nation, the Naamikai. And that means only actual kin? Okay. Because no question were asked by rabbis later. But I, and this is where I am interested in Good. the rabbinical approach. I'm criticizing what the Bible is saying. The Bible is saying, not the tone, the not the tone of the empire. It should not be vengeful against the, the kings or so. And then comes the issue of the after the Okay. If I understand correctly, the question really is, how did this transition from love your co-descendant as yourself to love your neighbor in the sense of not just your actual kin, but maybe first of all, all okay. Jews, your nation, and then to maybe all Jews and all some other people. I think the best explanation is actually in this quote from Jared Diamond. He said, people did this when it just, the option of continuing to fight anyone who is not your kin or your people just was not going to work out. So you at least tried and argued and debated. Well, maybe we should start treating these other people as if they were our people, our kin, whatever. My point here in emphasizing why I think Diamond's much more accurate than this view that this all started with Jesus is that everywhere in the world, well, many places in the world, starting thousands of years before, this debate was going on. And you see examples in different cultures in which all of a sudden, okay, in East Africa, there are two categories of people that we would call Nur and Dinka. Okay? Nur had been fighting and killing the Dinka. Okay? The British attack. There's debate, and all of a sudden, the Nur starts saying, you know what? 
your ancestor Dinka and our ancestor Nur, they were named after their ancestors, they were both sons of God. And why did they do that? Because it promoted them to fighting together against the British. Again, that's why I meant by all of history, Jewish history, which I don't know, I bet, sees this debate in series, and sometimes it kind of works out, other times it doesn't, and you get these horrible wars. But that's the, the, the process. And all of this is fairly recent in evolutionary terms. It's made possible because we've been designed to be influenced by parents to be altruistic towards some people and not others. So by changing those, that influence to some degree, there has been some expansion as to who gets treated well, but not nearly as much as we might like. Is that at all? Oh, yeah. Okay. Thank you for your question. Go ahead. You can pick. I'll, I'll, uh, at the beginning, I certainly did seem to dim dismiss group selection. Yeah, yes, I, I did. About that because obviously, in a group, you have a strong solidarity with members that are altruistic. You be stronger than a group of even those that are not. And uh, we can look not at the evolution of uh, advantage of individuals, but of societies, of groups, and look at. Okay, so the question was, what's really wrong with group selection? Why don't I think it's likely to be an evolutionary cause of human behavior? The first, and the only reason I'll, I'll address, because I think it's the, the most fundamental one, is it's never been shown how selection for altruism at the level of groups could operate fast enough to offset selection for selfishness within a group because selection for selfishness in a group happens each generation of human life. Group selection, now, it's kind of hard to know exactly what those groups really are and exactly when selection would take place since groups don't die or reproduce, at least, you know, because they're reified abstractions. But that's always been the problem, is how can group selection offset what would seem to be a faster selection at the individual level? I actually have I could talk about the problems of group selection a long time, but that's probably the, the most well-known and, and most widespread objection. So we can talk more. Maybe you can convince me. After you tell me how I can tell who the true believers are, okay? Because which would be known as multi-level selection, but I don't see how it can be at selection anything above the individual. That's my particular view on this. If group selection is going to have operated, it was probably on the most simple forms of, of life. I'll add one more problem with group selection applied to humans. It's easy to talk about the human group you belong to. But in reality, as an anthropologist, you go looking around the world, you don't see distinct groups of people. The Noor, again, for example, this East African pastoralist society, you ask the Noor, what group do you belong to? He or she may say, I'm an X the name of his father. In a different context, you ask, what group do you belong to? And he says, I'm a zebra, the name of his great, great, great grandfather. That's his group. In another context, later in the same day, he'll say, I'm newer. It's easy to talk about humans as if they form groups. It's very hard to decide exactly what is the group of humans that's being selected, that's surviving or not. It's a reified abstraction that I think is easier to talk about than to actually identify and show that selection takes place at that level. Yes? Uh, well, thank you very much for a very fascinating lecture. Um, I have a question on methodology or principle. Good. We're talking mostly biology, sociology, and anthropology. 
First, I would say that the explanation that we believe in God or an afterlife, because it makes us feel better, but essentially what you're saying, is not a competing explanation to an evolutionary explanation. The evolutionary explanation would ask, but why has feeling better in that particular way been favored by natural selection? So you could have both those explanations working together. Personally, again, my problem is I don't know how to do a study on whether belief in the afterlife or belief in God causes some kind of behavior. Because again, I can't tell which of you believes in God. I can't tell which of you believes in an afterlife. To convince me that you can, all you have to do is tell me how would you know? Or do you know? Do I believe in God? Do I believe in an afterlife? If you can answer that question and tell me how you know, then I'll know how to identify belief. All I can identify is talk. And I try to explain talk by, well, how does that talk influence other people? So I would look at, this is just me, how does talk of an afterlife or talk of God influence the behavior of others in a way that might be favored by natural selection? How did it, the world come to have many different languages? How did the world come to have many different languages? Is that the question? Well, language as language, because you are communicating to us, and we are understanding your language. Eh. So, <laughs> <laughs> so in the evolution, language plays a very, very, very important role. Yes. Okay. I would say that you could not have religion without language. Because okay. I say what you actually identify with your senses is not belief, but a certain type of language. What? True. Okay. Now, as to why you get different, okay, first of all, language was an adaptation because it helped us influence others. I think influence her kids. Okay. That was really the key benefit to language. Okay. It splits off because when you have, sometimes these individuals wander that way. And these wander that way, and they never see each other again. And eventually, many generations down the road, they're speaking different languages that they wouldn't understand. So that's how you get different. You get traditional languages diverging. But I think the key to language is it's a way to influence behavior, particularly, I think, the behavior of descendants. Thank you. Thank you.